excited. This is crazy. Like, I just got here. Now I get to be with everybody. And so I am very, very excited about that. And you know, I feel like so many of you guys don't know me. And it's hard, because then I'm like, OK, well, we don't want to make the whole thing about, like, hi, my name's Chanel, and let me tell you all about my life, you know? This isn't communion, so maybe that'll be a different day. Um, but I am excited to share my heart with you guys, the things that God is always always teaching me, you know, all the little rough areas that aren't even healed yet. So excited to get to talk about those things. So I'm just grateful to be here. Um, I am super thankful to Ashley. Her husband has my child. Oh, praise the Lord, because she would be climbing the walls right now. She'd be up here terrorizing. So, so, so grateful for you, sis, um, so that we could even be here together right now. So praise God for that. Um, so the title of our lesson tonight, it's a little odd, but it's called Ham or Eggs. Now, how many of you guys have ever heard that before, that term ham or eggs? What's up? Okay, what about like not in a breakfast sense? Anybody? Anybody? Uh -huh. Okay, good. Good, good, good. That means you don't know what I'm talking about. So good. That brings us to our first point. Our first point is chicken or pig. Now, with chicken or pig, this is actually a, a business fable. It's about business, and I'll read a little bit of it for you. The business fable of the chicken and the pig is about commitment to a project or cause. When producing a dish made of eggs with ham or bacon, the pig provides the ham or bacon which requires his or her sacrifice. And the chicken provides the eggs, which are not difficult to produce. Thus the pig is really committed to that dish, has skin in the game, while the chicken is only involved, yet both are needed to produce the dish. So this is about commitment. Am I committed or am I involved? Am I ham or am I eggs? Now, the first time I ever heard this was on Grey's Anatomy. I love Grey's Anatomy. I've seen every episode, and I don't even like the show anymore. I'm, I'm committed, though. You know what I mean? Like, I'm just, I'm like 19 seasons deep, so I just have to, like, ride the ship until it just finally sinks, you know? I'm not even having a good time anymore, but amen. But I, I'm in it. I'm a ham type of person, you know what I mean? And so the first time that this is brought up in the show, it's one of the patients talking about how in love he is with his girlfriend and how he wants to marry her. And what he says is, pigs and chickens are used for food. The pig sacrifices himself and gives ham. He's committed. The chicken puts the eggs on the plate, thus he's only involved. Are you committed or are you involved in your relationship? And so in the thing, he's challenging one of the doctors on where are you at, do you really love her, or are you willing to give it all for her? And I have literally never forgotten this. <laughs> because for me, wholeheartedness is a terrifying thing. And now being involved isn't necessarily a bad thing. Many of you are here tonight, so therefore I would take it you're fairly involved in the church. You may give some eggs as far as your time, your money, your talent, your whatever. But ham is different. Ham is this is my life. I'm putting myself on the line here. I'm giving you me. I'm giving you the depths of me. The pig dies for the meal. The chicken can continue their life afterwards. And so in your relationship with God, this is what it brings us to. Are you a member of the church or are you a disciple of Jesus? Are you chicken or pig? Are you ham or eggs? So we are going to go through many, many scriptures but don't worry, have no fear. So look, I'm already flying through points because I was worried that this is gonna be kinda long. I'm a little long-winded, but I'm really working on it for you guys, okay? Also, I like 50 million scriptures. You know how some people can just camp out in one and just go so deep? That's not me. I like a million because I know me. I will not really believe you. <laughs> this is terrible. I will not really believe you that something comes from the Bible with like one or two scriptures. I'm just a little too, like, I don't know. That's how you feel about that one. That's your opinion. That's what you took from it. I need, like, 30. <laughs> and I'm like, I feel like there's a theme here. <laughs> I feel like God is really trying to tell me something. And so that is actually how I work in general, is I'm like, I need real proof. I need a solid argument that what you're saying is from God. 
So, our second point. <laughs> As you ponder, are you chicken, are you pig, are you ham, are you eggs? Our second point is a quote that I read recently by a man named David White, and it says, the antidote to exhaustion isn't rest, it's wholeheartedness. And so I want to talk a little bit about wholeheartedness. Those of you who have studied the Bible with our congregation, you know that our first scripture is on being wholehearted. In Psalm 119, we talked about you are blessed when you seek God with your whole heart, the entire thing. And so you want to reflect then, okay, if blessed is superlatively happy, if I'm not feeling super happy, it's actually a wholeheartedness issue. And that is hard for us to sink in. We're like, no, why, why would I give my whole heart? I'm unhappy as opposed to I'm unhappy because I'm not giving my whole heart. That's literally what the word of God said in the first scripture someone from here showed you. So wholeheartedness, um, yeah, that's not my jam because it's way too, really vulnerable is probably the right word for it. It's way too vulnerable. I remember the first time someone showed me that scripture. I was in Phoenix, Arizona. I was a crazy party girl at Arizona State University. This was about 15 years ago. I was 19. I was wild. I was prideful. I was, I don't, even, I don't, even, like, I don't know what miracle of God had to happen that I sat down and let somebody open the Bible with me. But I did. And they went to this scripture, and they were like, what do you think would happen if you sought God with your whole heart? And I laughed. I was like, Bleh! Like, I was, <laughs> like, scoffed. You know what I mean? Like, I was like, amazing things, right? <laughs> I was such a jerk. I don't know why they dealt with me. And they were like, okay. And then I start crying. <laughs> like, I'm all, like, arrogant. And then I'm, like, sobbing hard all of a sudden. They're like, why are you crying, dear? Right? And I'm like, like, I don't know. But it's because I knew that I had never done anything with my whole heart. Ever. I was like, okay, you might as well say, speak to me in Japanese. You know, like, I have never done anything. And I felt like I was wiser because of that. I was like, I'm a smart person. Why would I put all my eggs in one basket? That's silly. It's folly. <laughs> it's foolishness. You know what I mean? Why would I do that? Even in this generation, I mean, you don't want to be doing too much. You don't want to try too hard. You know, that's embarrassing. I was like, it'd be embarrassing to give my whole heart to something. But when they described, well, what if you gave it to God? It didn't take me very long to realize, well, that's probably the only thing worth my entire heart. It's probably the only thing worthy of everything that I've got. But I was like, that sounds ridiculous. Are you crazy? Why would I give my whole heart to something? Even now, sometimes we'll have uh, Bible talks, little Bible discussions on campus. And, you know, my husband will be like, what's something you gave 100% your whole heart to? And I'm like, ugh, make me deal with my issues again. Uh, and so usually I share about family, my husband, my child, and amen. That's true in the sense that that's the most heart I've ever given to something. That's for sure. <laughs> that's the closest I've gotten to 100% is God, husband, child. And it's because that's where I'm the most ham, <laughs> where I've got skin in the game here. I'm on the plate for these people. And even that was a scary place to get to. When we first got married, oh my gosh, I would like, <laughs> I would send Mike all the time, what to do if you're having a stroke alone? Or like, <laughs> like all these things. There's an active shooter at the mall. Where's the best place to hide? And he'd be like, what are you, why do you send me this? And I was like, I just don't want you to die. And he'd be like, why would I die? And I was like, I don't know. I care for you. Like, I would just freak out. Then came the stage of, what if he leaves me? What if he doesn't die? Death I could deal with. What if he cheats on me or leaves me? Then I'm like, I don't know if I can give you my whole heart because if you leave me someday, I don't want it to be like I gave everything to this man. Like this whole thing started going of I need to protect myself from my irrational hypothetical fears that I have created in my mind. And I was like, okay, well, this is not going well. And so I had to have a nice little talk with myself and Jesus again about how, you know, what if he stays <laughs> and now you've robbed yourself of good years because you only wanted to give half. You wanted to be careful. You wanted to protect yourself. Wouldn't you rather? And I was like, and then what if he leaves? Don't you want to have got everything you could out of this relationship before he goes? Don't you want to have wrung it dry with love before he heads off to wherever he goes? And I was like, yes, that is what I would rather have 
than have given half my heart in one of the most important relationships I have. And so for me, I've had to work through wholeheartedness forever. Um, there's something in the world called decision fatigue. I don't know if any of you guys have ever heard of it. Um, it's usually talked about in relation to uh, dieting <laughs> because they say that, say you're like, I'm gonna give up sugar you know, every day except for Friday, that you are actually going to have a very hard time all week long because you know that on Friday I'm gonna have it. What if I move it to Thursday? What if Thursday night feels like Friday? <laughs> like, I mean, you get creative. And it's actually your willpower shrinks more and more and more because of your body having to continually decide to do the right thing. As opposed to, I've given up sugar 100% and I will never touch it. As hard as that is, you don't have decision fatigue. It's something you should really look up. The brain gets weary of having to choose the right thing because you didn't decide to be 100%. When we're not all in, it wearies the brain. It gets tired of having to choose again and again to deny itself, as opposed to I'm 100%. Because then the brain doesn't have to think about it. It's a hard no. What's the problem? And so we are actually wired to be wholehearted in what we do. So let's look at a few scriptures. I said we'd probably go to a million, so uh, forgive me. Here we go. We're going to start in Numbers, Numbers 14. Numbers 14, Numbers 14, in verse 24, it says, But because my servant Caleb has a different spirit and follows me wholeheartedly, I will bring him into the land he went to, and his descendants will inherit it forever. Numbers 32. And it's okay if you don't get all these. Don't worry. There's many. I'm going to go to them, but, you know, if you can't keep up, no shame. Numbers 32. In verse 11, it says, Because they have not followed me wholeheartedly, not one of those who were 20 years old or more when they came up out of Egypt will see the land I promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Second Chronicles. It's right after First Chronicles. Is that helpful to anybody? Second Chronicles chapter 6. In verse 14, it says, He said, Lord, the God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven or on earth. You who keep your covenant of love with your servants who continue wholeheartedly in your way. Second Chronicles 15. In Second Chronicles 15, in verse 15, it says, All Judah rejoiced about the oath because they had sworn it wholeheartedly. They sought God eagerly, and he was found by them. So the Lord gave them rest on every side. Our last one on this is in 2 Chronicles 25. In 2 Chronicles 25, in verse, we can start in verse 1. It says, Amaziah was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 29 years. His mother's name was Jehoadan. She was from Jerusalem. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, but not wholeheartedly. That is one of the most terrifying scriptures to me ever. The fact that I could do what's right, and God still makes note, but she didn't do it wholeheartedly. Wow. Yikes. And so wholeheartedness, it's not just a happiness issue. It's not a blessedness issue. It's a salvation issue at some point if you are not wholehearted. And God knows. That's what's scary about it is people do not know when you are wholehearted. God knows when you're wholehearted. He knows when you're giving 100% or you're not. I mean, maybe, maybe I share my faith with 100 people and I get one friend who's willing to come to church with me. If I gave my whole heart, God's like, wow, wow. If any of you came in here and said I shared with 100 people and one person came, all of us would be like, yeah, you go, sis. But maybe it doesn't take 100. Maybe I text 10 people on my phone and one person comes. Our results may look the same, but what if I had shared with 100? 
it took me 10% of the effort to get the same result, and that's a very easy place to hide, is that what I'm doing looks like what you're doing, but it's not, and God knows that. I mean, if we were to run a mile, my husband, he was in track, and he'll tell you all about it. He's all Mr. All-Star or whatever. If we ran a mile, our times would be significantly different. <laughs> I mean, he's, you know, out there doing whatever, probably six, seven minutes, something like that. Maybe he's insulted by the time. I don't even know. <laughs> it's going to take me a while. <laughs> At some point, I will be walking <laughs> out of my side, <laughs> pondering my life decisions that have led to this point. But if I give my whole heart... God sees that it's not about, was he faster? And the West region, Southland, Metro Coast, this is a talented super region. Where some of you, you could do very little and it's gonna look real good. It's gonna look real good. But what if we actually ran as fast as we could? What if we shared with as many as we could? This kind of mindset, it's very hard for me. I am such a bare minimum person by nature. I am totally a, look, you've got one, I've got one. We both got one. Yay for us. As opposed to, did I give 100%? Did I give my all? Did I pour it all out? And it's especially hard just moving here to a big church. A small church, if I do nothing, nothing happens. Can't really hide, everybody can tell, like, see what's going on. This church is almost 1,000 people. There's a danger in that because I know for me, if I do nothing, people will actually still be saved. I'm like, wow, this is not depend on me. I could do a whole bunch of nothing. I could just be chilling all day, every day. And you know what? Someone's still going to stand up here and be like, this is my friend Susie who's come to make Jesus Lord. And I can be like, yay, Susie, you go, you go, guys. It's very, very easy to become lukewarm and a fired up church like this because there's so many places to hide. It is the danger. Uh, those of you who are in the West D group know that I was already sharing about, I was like, uh-oh, this is, this is very easy for me to be like, I'm gonna just chill back here. You guys are doing great. You go, you go, Glenn Coco. You guys are great, all you beautiful, fruitful people. Keep it up and chill. It is very, very easy. But as we've seen from the scriptures, God sees. He knows who's working and he knows who's not. And he takes note of it. And that is the last thing I want on my tombstone, is that she did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, but not wholeheartedly. Wow. Can't have that. That is what God judges us for. Well, let's keep it moving. So, third point. <laughs> Our third point here is, are you a member of the church or a citizen of the kingdom of God? Because that is not always the same, brothers and sisters. And that is my concern, is that, you know, we've got almost 100 women here in the Metro Coast. I know, I'm like, oh, check y'all out. But do we have 100 disciples of Jesus in the Metro Coast? 100 mini Jesus women running around the Metro Coast. Let's go over to Luke 13. In Luke 13. And in Luke 13, we're going to start in verse 22. It says, Then Jesus went through the towns and villages, teaching as he had made his way to Jerusalem. Someone asked him, Lord, are only a few people going to be saved? And it definitely feels like that sometimes. <laughs> I used to say that as a baby Christian. I'm like, only like eight people are going to make it to heaven anyway. <laughs> it's a lot of faith. Um, anyway, he said to them, Make every effort to enter through the narrow door, because many, I tell you, will try to enter, and will not be able to. Once the owner of the house gets up and closes the door, you will stand outside knocking and pleading, sir, open the door for us. But he will answer, I don't know you or where you come from. Then you will say, we ate and drank with you and you taught in our streets. He will reply, I don't know you or where you come from. Away from me, all you evildoers. There will be weeping there and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and all of the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves thrown out. Another scripture that is terrifying. These people are like, we ate and drank with you. Another account is like, we preached the word and drove out demons ourselves. One of the versions talks about, we were out here doing miracles. And he's like, who? 
I don't think we've ever met. And it is possible to know quite a bit about someone and have them not know you. I could tell you all kinds of facts about like Barack Obama or something, but it doesn't mean he knows me. If I see him on the street, he's not like Chanel, wow. And so some of us, we might know many, many things about Jesus, but Jesus is like, not sure we've ever met. And it's scary to me that God knows those kinds of things about us. And now these words are actually different. You know, the New Testament's all in Greek and whatnot. And so make every effort to enter through the narrow door in verse 24 versus many will try and enter. In the Greek, those are different words. Um, make every effort is agonizomai. It's where we get our word for agonize. Agony. <laughs> like, yikes. And try, they will try is a tail. And it means they'll desire. They'll really want to. I got to super want it. <laughs> oh, my goodness. He makes a distinction here that you can try. You can want it. What does trying look like? Trying looks like I go to church. How many people do you meet on the street that are like, I go to church? I believe in Jesus. I sing in the choir. I went on a mission trip. I've been to China. I've been also. I mean, people are out there doing a lot. They're doing a lot. But are they agonizing? Are they making every effort to enter through the narrow door? Because that is completely different according to Jesus. And it says a lot of people are going to be shocked on Judgment Day because they were members of a church, but not citizens in the kingdom of God. And I tell you, that, that terrifies me. I don't want to get up there and be like, do you know how many ICC churches I planted, Jesus? He's like, yeah, I know. I was there, and wow. You know what I mean? Like, I, I know I can't go up there and show some resume of all the things I've done. He wants to know, were you really following my son, Jesus? And so it's a scary thought, but it doesn't have to be. A couple things we got to keep in mind. Like I said, there's a parallel account that says, if you just do, <laughs> if you just do my will, you won't have to worry about this. But, you know, one of the scriptures people can let go of is it talks about that if we're not bound to the kingdom on earth, we're not going to be bound to it in heaven. Do you realize the implications of that? That means if we are not at church on earth, we're not going to be at church in heaven. <laughs> I would like to be at church in heaven. I feel like heaven's going to have a whole lot of church happening. And so things like that that we can take very lightly. I'll come when I can. I'll figure it out. If we are not here now, we might not be up there then. Secret sins. Secret sins are called secret for a reason. You know what I mean? Sometimes you got to bring it into the light. You might get caught. Well, that's the grace of God. That is the grace of God if you get caught. But most of the time it relies on you. And you want to think, are there secret sins? You know. You already know. If I'm talking to you, you already know I'm talking to you. You already know, yes, I'm smoking weed. I'm getting high. I'm getting drunk. I'm, you know, I've got this boyfriend on the side that I don't tell anybody about. I've got the guy at work. I've got, like, if you've got that going on, you can sit here pretty. I get it. My first day in church, I was dressed because I was raised Pentecostal. <laughs> so I understood you got dressed up for church my very first day at church. But it does not matter if your life doesn't reflect that. I sure did sit there and was like, well, what are these songs? <laughs> right? All confused. <laughs> and, you know, probably gotten high the night before, come from some party, sleeping with some random person. And I sat there and smiled through church because that's what you did growing up. That's what it was like. And I wasn't really considered strange for it. According to all my friends, I was a good person. They're like, look at you, getting up early to get dressed for church. Good for you. No one concerned about what I had done the night before. But I sat there and sang those songs and was like, one of the songs, I always joke about it in communion about like, uh, it's called I'll Be Listening. And basically it's like, if my robe is white, I'll hear him when he calls my name. And I remember singing this song and I was like, I don't know what that means, my robe is white. But it had never occurred to me <laughs> that Jesus could come back and I would not hear him. Like, I was like, what? <laughs> Whoa. Like, uh, 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 we need to turn that song back. Hold on. And then the next verse is, if my heart is right, I'll hear him when he calls me. I'll be somewhere listening for my name. And so you'd be surprised. When you are in sin, everything is convicting. <laughs> We're singing songs like, be with me, Lord. And you're like, be with me, Lord. Like, I mean, we feel it because we know. And that's the grace of God gnawing at our hearts saying, please just be open. I don't want a member. I want a citizen of the kingdom of God. <laughs> not having quiet times, prayers, not spending time in your word. We might think, oh, I'm busy. God knows my heart. I love him. Okay, if I just stop talking to my husband, who lives with me, 
<laughs> and he's like in my bed and I'm like, I don't talk to you. That's gonna create issues. If he stopped talking to me, do you know how mad I would be? I get so mad when he doesn't talk to me. Like, and it's hard because he's like an introvert. So in his mind, he doesn't realize how much silence has gone by. He always jokes about how like when we were dating and we would go to Devo, we lived out here, and we lived uh, by USC and devotional for campus was in like Orange County, you know, it's like And so we're driving and we're in the car for like two hours and he didn't speak the whole time, right? And I'm in there having conversations in my head. I'm like angry with him. Like, what? So by the time he drops me off at my house, I just get out of the car and close the door. When he retells the story, he's so dramatic. He's like, I just slam the door, blah, 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 blah. But in my mind, I was mad that not only was I mad that he hadn't spoken to me in two hours, I was like, well, I'm not going to say anything either. I want to see if he can hear my silence, you know? He could not. He could not hear my silence. <laughs> His, his mind was very loud, and because his mind was raging, he's like, you haven't spoken in two hours? I didn't even notice. And I was like, how can I be in a relationship with someone who does not notice? I have not spoken in two hours. So, if I did that to God, I think he would be justified in being upset that I don't want to talk to him. That, I, that my mind is raging so loud, I can't speak to you. He does hear our silence. And if that's going on, it's important to analyze, is there bitterness there? Because when it's hard for me to have quiet times, I'm usually mad. I don't want to talk to God. That's why I don't talk to people. Sadly, that's my sinful nature. You guys will uh, possibly see that. When I feel some type of way, I, I pull back. And when I want to pull back, it's usually with silence. I'm not the mean type. I don't say mean things, but I do not communicate them. I'm like, we're going to shut it on down. You don't get the goodness of me. And it's because wholeheartedness is an issue. I can feel like, do you deserve my whole heart? Do you deserve to be close to me? That's the hardest time for me to be wholehearted is when I feel hurt by God or by people. And I'm like, should I really keep giving? I already gave and you mishandled it. You fumbled it. You done fumbled me and no, no, no. I must protect. I must shut it on down. One time I had a disciple share with me that she thought I was shallow, right? So like fighting words, right? I was like, <laughs> I'm not shallow, right? <laughs> she was like, I think you're shallow, right? And I was like, I'm not shallow. And I was like, I'm guarded <laughs> is the difference. You wish to have access <laughs> to certain areas that you don't have clearance for yet. That's what's going on here. It's not that I'm shallow. It's that it's above your clearance right there. Needless to say, I got in a lot of um, <laughs> trouble. Had a long talk after that. Um, but I knew that's where I was at. Because I was like, I, there are parts of me that I don't know you yet and she's like well it makes it come across like there's no depth and I was like oh, I need some clearance for the depths but a lot of that was just because of pain it's like I've been hurt and I don't want to let you in to the holy of holies in here if you're gonna you know be knocking things around and be all careless about it you need to leave everything don't touch anything everything's fragile in here and that is when it's hardest for me to be wholehearted and so for you what holds you back from that kind of vulnerability, from giving everything you've got, for opening up the walls and the gates. Because the problem with those walls is they'll keep people out, but they keep you isolated within. They keep you good and alone inside. And we all need a little love. So the issue is lordship. Is it always comes down to is Jesus really lord of all? That's always what it comes down to if you're going to be a citizen in the kingdom of God. And so for that, you have to really examine your whys. I appreciate so much what Donna talked about on Sunday. I hope you guys were keying in, really listening to your why is how you stay faithful through it all, is where is that? And I know recently I was telling Mike that I was like, my why is so clouded. Where is it? Where is it? Because you can see, I mean, we are in a war out here, an absolute war. So why do you come to church? Why do you call yourself a Christian? Why do you call yourself a disciple? If you don't have scriptural reasons for why you are in this room, you will not continue to be in this room. I can promise you that. Like I said, we're all fun and lovely, but someone is going to hurt you, and you're going to leave. And so if you don't have Bible for why you do what you do, you will discontinue doing it. So let's figure out what is Lord. Is it work? Is it school? Is it your feelings? Is it your family? Is it your relationships, your friendships, your fear? Whatever it is, it's idolatry. 
because it's not Jesus. If it's not Jesus, then it's an idol. And we've got to repent, or we've got to, at a minimum, stop pretending. If you don't want to repent, that's between you and the Lord, but you could at least do us the favor of just, just telling us what's going on. So we're going to close out here with our last point. The greatest commandment. Now, most of you know this. It's in Mark chapter 12. The greatest one. The greatest commandment is important to me. Um, I, would, I wish it was for more spiritual reasons, but it's important to me because I told you I am a bare minimum, short cutty kind of person. <laughs> so I'm the person who's like, can you just, what's like the greatest? What's like the most important one, Jesus? So I can at least just start with that. Let me just bang that one out, all the little minimum ones we'll get to. But in Mark chapter 12, starting in verse 28, it says, one of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked him, of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no command greater than these. Well said, teacher, the man replied, you are right in saying that God is one and there is no other but him. And I love this because it's literally on the banners, if we had them here, <laughs> to love God and to love people. So yes, we've got to be, we've got to be ham. We've got to be totally sacrificial in our relationship with God, but we also have to love people at that same level. Whoa, that is significantly harder. <laughs> That's so much harder than loving God because I can't see God. <laughs> and so sometimes, you know, we can, take, we can take advantage of the invisibility of God. You know what I mean? We can be like, ah, God's okay with this. God's okay with that. Uh, if he was here, we would probably act much differently. So once again, we're going to look at about a million scriptures real quickly on love. What does biblical love look like here? Let's go to Romans 13. Because people you can see. I can see you. I can see you and you're upsetting me. Whereas God, I can be like, well, God loves me and Jesus loves me. This I know. You know, God is good all the time. There's no phrase like that for people. <laughs> There's no people are good all the time type of deal. And so I think that love people part is definitely the more difficult part of the commandment for sure. In Romans 13 and verse 8, it says, Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. That means I owe you love. Like I owe you money. I owe you love. You might feel like I don't owe anybody anything. No, biblically you owe them love at a minimum. In Romans 13 and verse 10, it says, love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. The law is about 613 commandments summed up with love. You could knock out 613 if you just loved people. Oh, amazing. In Galatians chapter 5. Galatians 5. In verse 14, it says, For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out, or you will be destroyed by each other. In James chapter 2. James 2. Like I said, I need a whole little Bible study on something to be like one over James 2 and verse 8. It says, if you really keep the royal law found in scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking it all. For he who said you shall not commit adultery also said you shall not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but you do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom, because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. That means mercy is a major component of love. 
you will have no relationship that lasts if you have not figured out how to show some mercy. Um, let's see, we're almost done here, don't worry. Like I said, I need to make a case. <laughs> we're going to go to 1 John chapter 2. In 1 John 2. In verse 9, it says, Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates a brother or sister is still in darkness. Anyone who loves their brother and sister lives in the light, and there is nothing in them to make them stumble. But anyone who hates a brother or sister is in darkness and walks around in the darkness. They do not know where they are going because the darkness has blinded them. Wow. That is scary. But the good part is, it says if you just love people, there's nothing in you to make you stumble. Like, wow, what a lovely solution. <laughs> but if I'm a loving person, there's nothing you can do to trip me up. Amen. We know 1 Corinthians 13, so I won't read all of it for you. But let's go to Luke 6. This is one of the more difficult ones, but we're coming in for a landing. And Luke chapter 6. This is probably the most difficult element of love for me. <laughs> it's this one right here. In Luke 6, in verse 27, it says, But to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If someone slaps you on the cheek, turn to them the other also. If someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. Give to everyone who asks you, and if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, because he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. Oh, my Jesus. <laughs> oh, my goodness. My husband and I get a lot of persecution. Lots. Whole articles. Everybody. Everybody's got feelings. If you plant enough churches, you're going to take everybody off. And... I don't sit around praying for those people. I pray about them. <laughs> we won't get into that once again because it's recorded. But I'm not like, wow, bless them. Oh, my goodness, Jesus, rain down your love and blessings upon them. No, no, that's not what the plan is. No, 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 sound like that. Some of my prayers sound like in the Psalms, you know what I mean? Some David struggling kind of like, if you've read the Psalms, you know how David feels. So they're a little bit different than that. But it says to love those who love you, even sinners do that. And that kind of dynamic, that can happen amongst friends, that can happen in the church, that can happen in marriage. Where, yeah, I took out the trash so you would do the dishes. Or I cleaned this whole house and you're not going to be nice to me? Boo. Or <laughs> it's like, am I serving because I love you? Not because I expect to be repaid in full in some way. <clears throat> it says that he is kind to the ungrateful. Being kind in general <laughs> can be a challenge for some people. It is my favorite trait. I love when people are kind. I feel that's why I'm like, actually taking care of my children is so kind. I mean, you just want to be around those kinds of people. You want to be around wholehearted, wonderful people. Like, when we talked about how wholeheartedness equals blessedness, in my mind, the first time I read that, sitting here, I was like, oh, that makes sense. That's why Cecilia is so fired up all the time. <laughs> it's because she's the most wholehearted person I've ever met. She's like, I've been here four weeks and like I was like wow because you're always doing the most and you see how contagious it is you feel it like when she's leading songs she's jumping I'm like I can I should run I already told you my background's like Pentecostal right so I'm just like I think I need to like go for a jog like this is amazing I feel like I can fly but that's what it's like to be around those kinds of people but if I'm like oh I just love them okay well that makes sense <laughs> they are lovable what about the people who are not that's what sets us apart as people of God. So let's close out with our last scripture. It's here in Hebrews chapter 10. And this is my probably one of my favorite verses in Hebrews. Can't really say something's a favorite verse in the whole Bible because, you know, it's a big Bible, a lot of verses, a lot of favorites. 
So in Hebrews chapter 10, I love this scripture because, like I said, being ham, being all in, sacrificing myself, my body on the plate is terrifying. And this scripture brings me so much comfort that I don't have to just be like, I gave some eggs, I produced something, I helped, there you go, I've contributed to the meal, but you know, I'm willing to be on the altar. And this scripture gives me so, so much hope. In Hebrews chapter 10, starting in verse 32, it says, remember those earlier days after you had received the light, when you endured in a great conflict full of suffering. Sometimes you were publicly exposed to insult and persecution. At other times, you stood side by side with those who were so treated. You suffered along with those in prison and joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property because you knew that you yourselves had better and lasting possessions. So do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. For in just a little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. And, but my righteous one will live by faith, and I take no pleasure in the one who shrinks back. But we do not belong to those who shrink back and are destroyed, but to those who have faith and are saved. And so tonight, I know this lesson can be challenging because it is scary to give your whole heart. But like we talked about, it is a salvation issue. And so I hope you guys can be ham. I hope you can be all in, that you can let go of the fear, the idolatry of it all, and we can move past being little chickens and get in there and be some pigs. So amen. Love you guys. Yeah.